Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. I'm Denise Kirkpatrick, President of Nantian Institute, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our 2022 Virtual Open Day, where we will share a little of what it's like to learn with NTI. On behalf of NTI, I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we walk, study and reside. I am joining you from the lands of the Wadi Wadi people of the Darawal Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and extend those respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of today. At the Nantian Institute, we give you the opportunity to study at your pace and in your own way. While we have a beautiful contemporary campus space located adjacent to the Nantian Temple, just outside of Wollongong, we also make it possible for you to study from home. Our subjects are available for online study if that's more convenient for you. Unlike most universities, our scheduling is flexible. You don't have to wait for a new semester to start in order to commence learning with us. And we encourage you to study in the way that suits you best. If you want to begin by studying one subject only, then that's okay. We're a small graduate institution. Here, you will learn with like-minded people, but you will also be exposed to a diversity of perspectives. Here at Nantian, you're not just a number. As one of our students, we know you and we work with you to ensure that you succeed. Your learning, inter inter your learning and your interactions with us will be personalised and take account of your circumstances, needs and aspirations. While we're a young university, we are a well-established and already have developed a strong reputation for our programs and our teaching. We are just 10 years old, but already we outperform many of our competitors in external measures of educational quality. We are proud of our great performance on external measures of the quality of our courses and teaching. In the most recent survey of graduates across Australia, we were ranked well above the national average on all measures of students' satisfaction, including our support for you, the level of engagement in learning and development of relevant skills. The skills and knowledge that you develop as students will enhance your personal life and will contribute to improved professional practice and performance. At Nantien, our teaching integrates introspection and experiential learning into academic study in a way that supports your academic and social engagement, creating an environment in which you will develop self-understanding along with analytical and critical capacities. Learning with us will help you cultivate skills for engaging constructively with others in a variety of personal and professional contexts. When you study with us, you will see that the focus of our teaching and your learning incorporates first person approaches that connect you to your lived embodied experience of your own learning. You will be in control of your learning and you will contribute directly to it. Our programs and your learning are supported by evidence from contemporary Western research and from established Eastern thinking and wisdom. It's impossible for us even now not to acknowledge the tumultuous effect of the COVID pandemic on society, individuals and the planet. The content and experience of our programs will equip you with skills and knowledge to accommodate and manage the disruption and uncertainty that faces us all. We will support you in developing the resilience, compassion and inner strength to respond productively in your personal life with family and friends and in the workplace. If you aspire to be a more compassionate leader and manager, we can assist you. And if you want to engage in scholarly and intellectual study of Buddhism, we can facilitate that. Our staff are the best in their field. 
You will be taught and guided by outstanding academics and professional practitioners who are leaders in their field of expertise. I expect that some of you are wondering, do I need to be a Buddhist to study at NTI? The answer to that is no. While some of your fellow students may be practicing Buddhists or scholars of Buddhist thought, this is not a necessary requirement to learn with us. What we ask is that you approach learning with an open and an inquiring mind. You may also be asking yourself, will I become a Buddhist by studying at NTI? Many of our students discover an interest in Buddhist teaching and some choose to pursue this. We hope that you will be influenced by our values of wisdom, compassion, committed service and practice. I want to thank you again for your interest in studying at Nantian Institute. I hope that the presentations today will provide you with more insight into what you can study with us and also the motivation to convince learning with us. Today's program will include presentations from our staff, some of which will occur in breakout rooms. This will give you the chance to hear about either our Buddhist related courses or our health focused programs. You will have the chance to ask questions in those breakout sessions and I encourage you to hold your questions until that time. We will be recording all of this, including the breakout sessions, and we will make it available to you on our YouTube site. You will receive an email with the link to the video when this is available. I am now pleased to introduce Dr Nadine Levy, lecturer in health and social wellbeing, who will lead us in a short guided meditation. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you. I'm delighted to have been asked to guide a short grounding meditation for you all before we launch into the event this afternoon. So the invitation for you now is to bring yourself into the present moment. You might want to start off by looking around where you are and opening to the sights around you, the objects, the light, the colours, with mindful awareness, opening up your senses, noticing your computer screen, the walls, the windows, the light or darkness in your room. And as you look around, relax and let yourself just take in your environment for a moment. Now you can notice that you're sitting on a chair or on a cushion on the floor. Notice your back on the chair. Or notice your weight on the cushion. And notice the contact points, either with the ground or the chair. And allow yourself to sit, simply sitting. And when you're ready, you can close your eyes and relax more fully. Let your eyes and face be soft. Loosen your jaw and let your shoulders relax and the arms and hands rest easily. You can roll your shoulders up, back and down and adjust your posture so that you're comfortable. And noticing what your body feels like from the inside out. You might notice that there are points of tension or contraction You might notice ease in the body. Whatever's there, welcoming it with a friendly, non-judgmental awareness.
Notice the sounds that come and go, including my voice. You might hear the humming of your computer, air conditioning, traffic noises, bringing present moment awareness to what's here. And receiving this with kind and friendly attention Now bringing your attention to your breathing. Can you locate your breath? If breathing isn't available to you or it doesn't feel comfortable to connect with the breath, please choose another anchor like sounds or the body. If you're comfortable with your breathing, Notice whether your breath is short, whether it's long, quick or slow. You might notice your breath most predominantly at your nostrils or your abdomen. Choosing one point to focus on, wherever you feel the, the breath most strongly. and connecting with the sensations of breathing. What does it feel like to sense into the breath? Not trying to alter the breath or control the breath. Not judging the breath. But simply just feeling what it's like to breathe. Allowing the breath to breathe itself. And when the mind wanders, you can gently bring the tension back to the breathing like a, a puppy that you're training with that same gentleness. Returning to the breath. Enjoying the breath. And now bringing to mind your intention for this afternoon. Perhaps you want to retain this sense of embodied presence throughout this event. Stay connected to your body and grounded in the present moment. Bringing that to mind. Remaining open to the various presentations and experiences you might have. And when you're ready, you can wiggle your toes and your fingers. Massage your brow and your forehead. And open your eyes to take in the screen.
And again, noticing the lights and objects and colors in the room, seeing things afresh and gathering your attention. So thank you all for being part of this event and for listening so attentively to that meditation. I'm now delighted to introduce my colleague, Dr. Sue Samskis. Dr. Samskis is the Head of Mental Health and Director of Continuing Professional Development at NTI. She's a registered health professional whose academic and research focus is on mental well-being, particularly of students and professionals through contemplative, reflective and mindful practices. Dr. Sumska sits on the Australian Compassion Council and is chair of the Contemplative Practices Interest Group of the Australian College of Mental Health Nurses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadine. Thank you for that lovely meditation. I'd like to share my screen if I may. So what I'm going to talk about today is not what we teach at Nantian, but rather how we teach it because we have a rather special, what we call a pedagogy, and I will um, enlighten you to what that is as we move through the presentation. So students come to study at Nantien for a variety of reasons, and sometimes they're quite different to why students might choose to study at other universities. So things that, are, that I've heard through the years here are that students come to understand themselves more deeply, or they have a real desire to start to work in a way that makes a difference in other people's lives. That could be through volunteering or it could be through a workplace. Certainly the wish is to either reduce their own suffering or to help reduce other people's suffering, but certainly it's about growing and flourishing and finding ways to do that in our own individual lives. So whilst we are similar to other universities in that our Curriculum is based on scientific evidence and professional research. It's taught by experts and academics. We're also quite different in that we have a very strong emphasis on the softer skills like emotional intelligence and the content and qualities of communication. We also have a very strong focus on learning to care for self while learning to care for others. And we do that through learning that is based on mindful, reflective and contemplative learning. So what is contemplative education? It's about revealing, clarifying and manifesting contemplative values and ways of seeing and being in the world. We're asking ourselves to use slightly different methodology to capture what is really going on here in front of us now in the present. So if we're sitting in an objective academic setting, we might view the world as, as being going on according to what the evidence is telling us. But so much more is going on around that. So, you know, picture a microscope in a laboratory. There's so much more going on around that microscope. Who is the researcher? What's the researcher's educational background? What's going on in the climate? What's going on in the world? So it's about deepening and broadening our perspectives beyond that of a traditional third person academic perspective. And how do we do this? Where do we start to learn to do this? We do it by starting to learn to sit in silence and to more deeply observe what's going on around us and to maintain an open and curious mind. And the excellent meditation that Nadine just gave us was a beginning activity in how we might sit in silence and how we might open our perspectives and open our perceptions around us in ways that we might not often do. So we can move through deepening layers of perception to apprehend a truth that might not have been apprehended had we not spent some time in contemplation. And I think that these are fundamental attitudes for education in the 21st century. We're living in a very volatile, uncertain, ambiguous and complex time, and it requires greater methods than have previously been used. So what is an educational pedagogy? Because I've mentioned that we use contemplative pedagogy. This is not about the content of what we're learning or the topics or the subjects. This a pedagogy guides how we learn. It's basically the sea in which the teachers and students are swimming. It's the teacher's approach to teaching. It's the learner's way of learning. It's the unseen education methods. And contemplative pedagogy is not something that's just used at Nantian. It's used all over the world in a whole variety of different contexts. So for example, it's used in the medical school at Harvard University. 
It's used to teach engineering at Amherst. It's used to teach physics. It's used to teach dance, arts. So really you can take any topic that you like and you can situate it within a more contemplative, reflective and mindful way of learning, which is what we've adopted here. So this is really well aligned with our values because our values are attitudes, they're ways of being in the world, to be compassionate, to be wise, to be committed in our service to others and to practice methods of keeping ourselves contained in that commitment. So this pedagogy really suits Nantian's values. And as I said, this is not a science that's distinct at Nantian. There is a very large emerging body of work called contemplative studies. And within that, you've got contemplative science, contemplative practice, and contemplative experience. And these are very strongly aligned with ancient Buddhist practices and ancient wisdom traditions. And so we're in the lucky position of being able to combine the best of both of those worlds to work through the content and the subjects that we offer to offer some slightly different and more um, meaningful approaches to very real world and life challenges. So the challenge in education, as we see it, is to teach students to care for themselves at the same time as learning to care for others. Where this is really important is in health studies, because I've spent a couple of decades nearly at a, at a major university preparing health professionals for practice. And what I noticed was that we didn't prepare them terribly well to deal with the tragedies that they would be facing, the cr critical situations that they would be working in. And that's become more so evident in COVID than at any other time. And so not being prepared to care for themselves through the, the lengthier and um, time that's available in an education process means that through these critical times, workforces have been falling over with burnout and with empathic distress and even secondary trauma. So an education curriculum that's designed to focus on teaching people to care for themselves means that we need to teach introspective practices. And that means learning how to be present, learning how to accept the moment that we find ourselves in, no matter the level of crisis, to identify and respond to what's arising in us in response to that crisis, and to deal with ourselves and our emotions in difficult circumstances. And evidence is very, very strong for the utility of approaches like mindfulness in settings to manage these sorts of situations. So we want to set ourselves up to meet each situation without stress and fear, and instead with openness and curiosity. And in so doing, we have compassion for ourselves and for others. It's how we turn up in the world. So I just want to say a couple of slides about where the crux of this is. And the crux of this learning is really in about learning to deal with the stress that we feel in our bodies, in the workplace or in volunteer settings when we come up against very complex and difficult circumstances. What happens with us is that our stress hormones fire off. We end up in fight, flight and freeze mode. Personal survival becomes our utmost up, up most of mind and what this does is it moves us into what we call self-referential thinking so while we're stressed at work while we're afraid at work our focus will be on ourselves and our own survival and our own well-being which necessarily closes down our ability to feel others it closes down our ability to be empathetic and also to act with compassion in those moments because we are stressed and we are anxious and we are not not open but we are in survival mode so what uh, research has shown us in the last, say, 10 years is that very helpfully at the exact same time that our cortisol and adrenaline are, reduced, are released in the stress function, we also have another chemical called oxytocin released. And oxytocin is what's called the social hormone. And it does exactly the opposite thing to the stress chemicals. So where the stress chemicals throw us into fight and flight, oxytocin brings us in to rest and digest. It slows our heart rate down, it lowers our blood pressure, it dilates our, our, our blood vessels, it relaxes our system, it rises our immune system. But there's one key ingredient here. In order to get oxytocin to continue to flow, we need to connect with somebody else because its evolutionary purpose is for us to reach out when we're stressed to somebody else for help or for support. And that is the part that ensures our survival. So it restores our feelings of safety, it asks us to connect to others and it protects our health. So if you are a stressed person working in a very stressed environment and you are able to use introspective and mindful, reflective and uh, contemplative means 
to grasp the fact that you're stressed, to know that you have this other capacity available to you, to reach out for help, to stabilise your system, then you are going to protect your ability to be empathetic and compassionate in your work and you're also going to protect your own health. So this is the crux of where these educational approaches offer the difference. So a contemplative education is slightly different in that, as, as our president Denise mentioned, it offers first person inquiry. So third person inquiry in education is when we learn about others, when we look at others, when we experiment on others, investigate others. First person inquiry is when we look within, when we become introspective, when we examine ourselves and how we are responding to the process of education. So we notice what's in there, we attend to ourselves first, we attend to what we find inside ourselves, particularly if it's stress, we respond to that compassionately. And in so doing, we can then expand ourselves out into the world, into to being of service and to fulfilling what it is that we, that we are wanting to um, achieve. So this introspection gives us the ability to look within, to notice if we're suffering or exhausted, if we're lacking in empathy or lacking in compassion, and we can respond to that. One of the things that's been noted in research is that people who don't have this capacity tend to use what's called sealing over. So they will seal over their anger, they will seal over their emotions, they'll seal over their frustrations and they'll take that home with them after work. And then often unhealthy means are used to continue to suppress those unprocessed things or to release them. And uh, contemplative education through pre uh, consistency of the process of education teaches us how to start to address and work with these things. So what are the study skills that are involved in this type of education? And a lot of the 21st century leadership literature that's around at the moment about mindful and compassionate leadership, authentic leadership, servant leadership, you'll notice these words are in there. And this is the ability to not be distracted, the ability to reflect, to have periods of silence, to set intentions, to use wisdom, to be mindful, to pay attention, etc. But a lot of this is about uh, contemplation and contemplative education is not just about self. It's about getting self to a, a place of equanimity so that we can then look outwards, we can expand our view, and we can take our potential for action out into the world. So we can look at, we can examine things, examine impermanence, examine the causes and conditions, look at expansive and inclusive self we can then contemplate the planet, the people in it, our neighbours, our family in new ways, connect in new ways, and also to realise that we are connected. So within a classroom, within a physical classroom, and there's a teacher present, these are some examples of what contemplative practices in a classroom might look like. I've taken some of these from various curriculum around the world, and we use many of them here at Nantien. So there are personal practices, there are social practices, there are ethical practices, and there are compassionate practices. And you'll find these sprinkled, um, sorry, sprinkled throughout the curriculum. But what we ha also have at Nantien is that not all of our students are studying in a classroom with other students and with a teacher. And so we have developed a contemplative online way of learning, which is really the classroom where there is no teacher, your home learning by yourself, and this is the learning framework or the pedagogy that you can use to mindfully, reflectively and contemplatively educate yourself using the materials that are provided. So I'll only go through a couple of these just to give you a bit of an idea of what we're talking about. So setting an intention for our learning is about when we are at home intending on studying, being really intentional about that and working out why, why am I doing this study? Who is this to benefit? How is it going to benefit me? How is it going to benefit others? And this helps us connect with our motivation to study. And then we, we ask you to clear your study space of all distractions and set up your study area so that you're actually facilitating your own period of learning. And then we ask you to work out what you're going to focus on. Your objects of focus might be your, your lessons online. It might be reading a chapter of a book. It might be a journal article. It might be all of those. But to say, right, this is my period of focus and I'm going to notice when my attention strays and I'm going to bring it back just as we did in the exercise with Nadine when we brought our attention back to the breath after we strayed. We practice in education to bring our attention and our focus back to the study materials so that we maximise the period of time we've set away to study and we don't get lost on going down rabbit holes on YouTube or whatever. You know, we, we intentionally plan our study. 
And the next one and the last one I'll speak about is to notice. And this is where, the, where we do our first person learning. This is where, as we read through our materials, as we encounter new knowledge, as we encounter new ideas, we also check inside ourselves to see how we feel about that, how we're meeting those ideas. As an example, I could say, that we graduated quite a number of students into health professions who had not had their beliefs exposed to the light of day. They would behave in prejudicial ways. They hadn't had their stigma challenged. And so noticing the way in which the materials meet us and how we feel about what we're learning is where we start to connect with our beliefs and our values, identifying when they need to be modified. So uh, there's far more information available online or please feel free to contact if you'd like to know more about this learning model, but that's as far as I could go in the time that I've got today. I just wanted to give you a little bit of an idea about what we have. So the NTI education difference is that we are a scientific evidence-based curriculum. We're steeped in contemplative education methods and Buddhist theories of mind and life to learn to recognize arising thoughts and emotions, accept that they are there, view them with non-attachment and non-judgment and respond with compassion to ourselves and to others in all contexts. And these are 21st century workplace attitudes. They're essential. So please experience the difference. We encourage you to study with us with our curriculum that's purposefully designed to support your personal and professional and social and emotional and ethical and compassionate development. And I thank you very much for your time today and for listening. And now I would like to introduce you to our next speaker, who is Dr. Jonathan Page, a medical oncologist who delivers our subject health as Buddhist practice. And Jonathan will speak about the importance of compassion and grace in both his professional and personal roles. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Sue. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction and thank you for your presentation, which uh, melds into mine very well, I think. So indeed, my name is Dr. Jonathan Page and I'm a sessional teacher in Applied Buddhist Studies at the NTI. I'm gonna be talking about compassion in particular and just how vital it is uh, to our individual lives and the life of the planet and how this will be even more so in the future as various uh, crises unfold. So it is an honor to be talking to you all this afternoon. And I'm gonna begin by talking a little bit about my own life and how I have be, uh, benefited greatly from the teachings that are available to everybody through the Nantian Institute. So I've had a lifelong interest in Buddhism beginning with my early travels through Southern and Southeast Asia back in the 1970s when I was merely a young man. So everywhere from Afghanistan right around to Vietnam, spending time in every country and going back to many for a second or third time. And I've been a medical oncologist. So I've been a doctor specializing in the treatment of cancer uh, for 40 years. And uh, that also involves being a specialist physician in palliative care, which is mostly the caring for people who are dying. So my medical education spanned 14 years and I was trained in the art and science of cancer diagnosis and treatment with chemotherapy, radiotherapy and surgery, and later on in the care of dying patients and their families. And I still do a lot of this work. So during my career, I have treated and often befriended hundreds of patients, mostly suffering with advanced cancer, and they ranged in age from the youngest of 16 to the oldest of 103 years of age. Now, unfortunately, most patients eventually died of their cancer, some within weeks, some decades later. Now, of course, the cancer symptoms such as pain were managed carefully, but there was often very little attention to the patient's lived experience, particularly in the past, but this is still a big issue. So there's little attention on the what I would call the psycho-spiritual domain, the patient's mind, their psychology and their spiritual concerns. And so this includes their fear of the future after a diagnosis of cancer, the impact of their illness on their family, 
and that includes their children. And some of these children may be very young. And the fear of death itself. Thus, patients often suffered severely, but quietly and in private. And this deficiency in the doctor patient relationship was essentially due to a lack of true compassion, which had not been taught and for many people is not a natural quality. Things have improved, but there's far more improvement yet to expect. And of course, this lack of true compassion also impacted on the doctor's well being. And this leads to burnout and depression, as Sue has already mentioned, particularly with COVID, but in many other circumstances around the world, if we consider the life people lead in other countries. And these, these issues with burnout and depression certainly affected myself. Nonetheless, certain clinical experiences can prove truly transformational. And I'll tell you about one such profound experience from my own life long ago when I was just 35. And this experience strangely returned into my consciousness quite recently with great clarity. So my dear patient, Jane, when I was 35, she was of the same age. She was married with two young children, Sam and Jessica, who were aged four and six. Now Jane had breast cancer that had already spread to her lungs. And as a dutiful young oncologist, I prescribed the appropriate chemotherapy drugs. And I began that treatment six weeks before the current experience. And I had explained the side effects to Jane and her husband and the chance of improvement in detail, but I knew little about Jane's inner world, the love of her family, her hopes and plans, the future she saw with her children. All of this now cruelly disrupted by the diagnosis of cancer. So Jane had returned for review by me after two cycles of chemotherapy, and I had already seen her latest chest X-ray, and it showed a marked improvement in the cancer in her lungs. And I was happy with this and couldn't wait to tell Jane. She entered my office and sat down. I only barely noticed her flushed face, her moist eyes, and her trembling lips. Her head was now bald due to the chemotherapy. I stood up and placed the x-ray films on the screen. Such improvement I saw, I was so pleased. Now, as I turned to demonstrate this response to Jane, my eyes met hers directly, becoming locked for a brief second. And I suddenly saw through the tears, her tears at that stage, I saw, and importantly, I felt for the first time ever, another person in profound distress. And I discovered a reality that had been foreign to me. From the day of diagnosis, six weeks earlier, all day and all night, she had been consumed with her impending death, alone, traveling into the unknown, leaving her babies behind without a mother and her beloved husband and her parents grieving for life. There'd been no word of comfort, no conversations at home, no real solace found in the clinic. The improved chest X-ray that had pleased me so much was to Jane of little importance. She would still die, gaining perhaps a year of life with the treatment. The X-ray reflected one tiny physical aspect of Jane's life. In one moment, a pale metaphor of her fundamental and ineffable reality. The map can easily be confused for the landscape of noisy, bustling, and ever-changing life. So, thankfully, without knowing exactly how or why, I sat down near Jane and quietly asked her to tell me about her life, while I actually managed to listen, and deeply, and I heard and felt so much. She wept and told me of the fears that she suffered and her great sadness. And I felt the same deep sadness and experienced our interconnectedness, and that with all life. This must be true compassion, I thought, with the wisdom to know that Jane was at last finally receiving the care that she desperately needed, and thus too would her family. 
After some time, Jane finally settled, inhaled deeply, wiped her eyes, and then smiled broadly, and I smiled back. So I found this magical discovery of compassion very deep within myself quite overwhelming. Or rather, I was grateful for its beneficent emergence just when the situation had become critical. So I vowed to become more adept in the skills of this wonderful quality of shared suffering. Now, I should mention that part of my uh, presentation today, I owe to Roshi Joan Halifax, who presented the address at the recent graduation ceremony at NTI. And she has described some years ago a system to arouse compassion whenever needed, to monitor its impact on oneself and on the other person, and to maintain one's energy and integrity, and finally, to conclude the experience. So I'll just share my, my screen to continue. So compassion is vital, and I'm talking about the the importance of, uh, of grace. I should say to begin with that um, empathy, compassion and service are of great importance. And a world without empathy is a world that is dead to others. And if we are dead to others, we are dead to ourselves. The sharing of another's pain can take us past the narrow canyon of selfish disregard and even cruelty and into the larger, more expansive landscape of wisdom and compassion. Empathy alone, however, may lead to burnout. We have to be careful of this. But there is only rarely compassion fatigue because of special properties that compassion contains. Helping, fixing, and serving represent three different ways of seeing life. When you help, you see life as weak. When you fix, you see life as broken. But when you serve, you see life as whole. Now, compassion is of supreme importance in Buddhism and in life in general. So compassion is one of the four great Brahma Viharas or divine abodes or immeasurables, together with loving kindness, empathetic joy, and equanimity. So each of these must be cultivated assiduously and they work interdependently. Now, I'll just quote two examples from Buddhist texts that focus on compassion. One from the Vilama Kirti Sutta, where the Bodhisattva, in other words, the embodiment of compassion, loves all living beings as if they were her only child. She becomes sick when they are sick and is cured when they are cured. A second authority, Shantideva, from the 8th century in the landmark a guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life, says, for as long as space endures, for as long as living beings remain, until then may I too abide to dispel the misery of the world. So compassion is a deeply felt sense of suffering, rather than a concept that one may read about. And it is the suffering of all sentient beings, including Mother Earth herself. And this is achieved through a state of non-self, anatta. In other words, to fully develop compassion, we must develop a reduced sense of ego and begin to sense the life of the other person. And, and we develop a sense of a non-dualistic interbeing. So we and the other person and all people exist together and interconnected. And this comprises a necessary wisdom and energy and discernment that ideally arise together, and then requiring a particular response, which may include the sense of presence, silence, sustained attention, warmth, emotional attunement, which is a state where we can see into the consciousness of the other person and share it. There is a sense of timelessness, and then possibly as a result, certain wise actions may arise. Now, importantly, compassion is a particular complex, knowingly felt sense. It's a moral phenomenon that we experience within the heart, mind, body, heart, mind, body that must be 
identified as such by the novice, by the student, and then developed further through arduous but supported exposure on the battlefield of life. But learning also of the self-benefiting altruism that sustains this benevolent practice indefinitely. So compassion, in fact, can become a wellspring of resilience as we allow our natural impulse to care for another to become a source of nourishment for ourselves rather than depletion. Developing our capacity for compassion makes it possible for us to help others in a more mindfully skillful and effective way. So the GRACE model of Roshi Joan Halifax represents five states, G, R, A, C, and E. And we begin with G, gather your attention. Pause, meditate on the breath, give yourself time to become grounded. Invite yourself to be present and embodied by sensing into a place of stability in your own body. And of course, one performs meditation and other practices to develop these qualities. Interrupt your assumptions and expectations and allow yourself to relax and to become engaged. The second quality, R, recall your original intention. Remember your calling to be of service. Why am I here? Locate your heart, allow it to open. Your motivation keeps you on track, morally grounded and connected to your highest values. A, attune, check in with yourself, then with the other. First notice what is going on in your own mind and body. Then actively sense into the experience of the other person. Listen deeply, note voice tone, body language, sense without judgment. Open a space in which the encounter can unfold, accepting whatever may arise in yourself and in the other. Notice the mutual acknowledgement and exchange. The richer this mutual exchange, the greater the capacity for attunement, unfolding, and ultimately, transformation of both yourself and the other person. The next quality, C. Consider what will really serve the other person by being truly present and allowing insights to arise. As the encounter unfolds, notice what the other person might be offering in this moment. What are you sensing, seeing and learning? Ask yourself, what will really serve here? Draw on your knowledge and experience, but also be open to seeing things in a fresh way. Your insights may fall outside of a predictable category. Don't jump to conclusions too quickly. Drop down into openness and value the state of not knowing. Curiously, the state of not knowing is of great importance or even unknowing, which opens us up to a much wider horizon. And finally, E, for engage and act ethically, allowing for emergence, then end the interaction. So engage and enact, compassionate action emerges from a sense of oneness, connectedness, and discernment. This action might be a re recommendation of some sort, an open question about values, or simply allowing the relationship to organically fill the remaining time with this other person. These aspirations may not always be easily realized. There may be deeply rooted conflicts in goals and values that must be addressed over time. So gently end the interaction, release, let go, meditate on the breath for a moment, explicitly recognize internally that the encounter is over. Acknowledge what transpired with gratitude for what you have learned and what you have been able to achieve and self-compassion. Then move on through completion into a state of equanimity. So self-compassion is of great importance. We must not forget to meditate on this quality on a regular basis. Through a great self-compassion, we acknowledge and accept our human, our own human afflictive emotions, which include various attachments, subversions, ignorance, pride, jealousy, and others that cause so much suffering. 
but we choose a corrective path of wisdom, ethical conduct and mental discipline. Thus we become well prepared to extend our compassion to others and this will be of great importance in the years ahead. Now I might just go through some of the important principles of meditation on self-compassion. And if you wish, you can close your eyes, but otherwise just listen. In this, uh, in this type of meditation, we gently scan our body and mind and let go of any tensions that we may discover. We should keep our spine straight and strong whilst the belly remains soft. We soften and relax our hands, and in so doing, we stop the process of unattended grasping. We develop a quality of curiosity and confidence about this meditation. We remain aware that we are always interconnected with others. And we actually experience this sense of interconnection. We focus on the rhythm of our breath and re remember that this rhythm is that of all sentient beings. We place the palm of our right hand on our heart, feeling the warmth of our heart. And we become aware of feelings of compassion that reside in that place. We all have a deep wish to reclaim and maintain the love of ourselves and to be loved unconditionally by others as a model for loving others, for loving others also in an unconditional way. We ask ourselves, what is it that I wish for myself from the depth of my heart? Well, we may wish for safety, joy, peace, love, connection, meaning in life. We can understand what others wish from the depth of their hearts. We pay attention to our own essential goodness and therefore understand the essential goodness of others. We remember our own good deeds, intentions, honesty and love, which we may forget and focus on some of our negative attributes. If we sense any resistance, then we hold that too in our vast inner space in loving kindness. We declare, I sincerely wish myself well and wish myself free from suffering. I wish myself peace and safety in the world. And we can wish exactly the same for other people. I will now give myself the love that doesn't judge, the gift of self-compassion. And likewise, I will act with compassion wherever there is suffering in the world. And finally, and perhaps surprisingly, I want to just mention one or two words about vulnerability, since it may seem that as we develop our power of compassion, that we may dispense with a sense of vulnerability, but not so. Vulnerability must be cherished and cultivated. And as David White, the great Anglo-Irish poet tells us, the only choice we have as we mature is how we inhabit our vulnerability, how we become larger and more courageous and more compassionate through our intimacy with disappearance. Our choice is to inhabit vulnerability as generous citizens of loss, robustly and fully, presenting at the gates of existence with exuberance, striding through with confidence and the vow to be of service. So thank you for your attention. I hope you've learned through my presentation some more aspects about compassion and how important it is to assiduously develop compassion and to be available at all times to help others. Thank you. Jonathan, thank you very much. I'm sure that everyone will agree that your presentation effectively integrated your lived experience, a life practice and intellectual and spiritual reflection. Your presentation today highlighted for us the value of compassion and the important role that it plays in a positive and productive contemporary life. I think right now we speak so lightly of compassion in our everyday life but it is a far more profound concept of practice than the glib reference to thinking about others. So thank you very much for sharing with us this afternoon. Students are the heart of Nantian Institute, and we believe that as well as hearing from our staff, 
that it's important that you hear from our students. And we're pretty sure that you want to hear about the student experience from their voices. So I'm very pleased that two of our past students have agreed to share their Nantian Institute experience with you today. Dr. Cecile Manikan is a professional trainer and a course designer of executive training programs in the field of transformational leadership and management at the Asian Institute of Management and the Ateneo de Manila University Graduate School of Business. She is an expert in whole brain self-mastery, which is a foundational course in management and educational courses, which she and her mentor, Eduardo Morato, introduced to basic and tertiary education in the Philippines. Cecile holds an executive doctorate in education leadership from the Development Academy of the Philippines and a master in business management from the Asian Institute of Management. Before that, she pursued her continuing education in arts management at the New York University and was faculty champion of the Managing the Arts program at the Asian Institute of Management from 2000 to 2006. She is the author of the book, Becoming a Great Teacher, published in 2019. Prior to her educational career, she served as Executive Director of Ballet Philippines, the national company for ballet and contemporary dance of the Cultural Centre of the Philippines. Dr. Manakan was awarded a graduate certificate in humanistic Buddhism and a graduate diploma in applied Buddhist studies from Nantian Institute in 2021. She is a member of the Program Advisory Committee for Humanistic Buddhism and Applied Buddhist Studies at Nantian. Dr. Manakan is an advocate of contemplative pedagogy and mindfulness practice, which she learned at NTI. As an active participant of the communities of practice at Nantian, her interest lies in co-creating global peace and harmony through humanistic projects and interreligious studies and dialogue. Unfortunately, Cecile can't join us via Zoom today. However, she has provided a short recording in which she shares her experience of studying humanistic Buddhism with NTI. Thank you. Greetings. My name is Cecil Manikan, a non-Buddhist adult learner and alumna of the first graduate certificate course in Humanistic Buddhism in 2020. I am also a graduate diploma holder of Applied Buddhist Studies, which I took in 2021. That was at the height of the pandemic, but on hindsight, it was a marvelous period of discovery and inner blossoming. So you might want to ask, what brought me to Nantian? I am an educator and I came to know Nantian in 2018 during the Fok Wang Shan International Academic Conference in Taiwan where Nantian's Venerable Zhu Wei and other education leaders at that time presented what to my mind was an educational positioning that addressed urgent concerns of the times. Man's feeling of isolation, alienation, and the consequent disconnection within himself, others, and his environment. Also, mental health issues that are rising all over the world, threats of climate change, as well as ethical issues and downside of global technology. Listening intently, I thought that no other educational agenda could be more apt, timely, and relevant at this critical time. With English as medium of instruction at Nantian, its educational promise became even more compelling for me. So I enrolled first in Humanistic Buddhism, where I experienced firsthand the effectiveness of contemplative pedagogy the integration of mindfulness practice derived from the 2,600-year-old Buddhist practice of meditative concentration that led the Buddha 
to his own enlightenment. Through regular mindful pauses, contemplative pedagogy promotes focus and concentration for better learning. It establishes mind-body connection so that balance could be sustained and strength and stamina may be present at all times, such as required by intensive five-day virtual classes. But more importantly, contemplative practice cultivates reflection, one that lends itself to insightful, imaginative, and creative learning. It is in this sense that contemplation accesses direct knowledge that cannot be taught. It is learning beyond education. As a Buddhist institution, the core value of Nantian's education revolves around the Bodhisattva ideal, the enlightened being who through compassion defers his own nirvana in order to serve and liberate the collective. And universally, everyone is a potential Bodhisattva. Thus, by exploring and cultivating the highest possibility of being, Nantian education brings to modern learners not only what is timely, but also what is timeless in our ability to cultivate wisdom and morality that would make us understand what it means to be human and humane in a tumultuous, complex, but highly and intricately interconnected and interdependent world. As for the classes, yes, they are intensive, but ample time is given for preparation to study materials prior to the actual five-day virtual sessions. The class composition is culturally diverse, with students from different backgrounds and ages from all over the globe, brought together by the same aspiration to become better, kinder people for others and the world. So come and experience Nanjian, whether you are on the track of pursuing a degree or you are for continuing education just like me. The Bodhisattva within awaits you at Nanjian. Enjoy the journey. Thank you. That was such a pleasure to hear from Cecile. Our next student is Alana Blake. Alana is a registered <coughs> nurse with more than 15 years experience. She has postgraduate qualifications in mental health nursing, healthcare leadership, health, alcohol and other drugs, health professional education, brain and mind science, and most recently, a Master of Arts, Health and Social Wellbeing, completed with us, Nantian Institute, in 2020. Alana has extensive experience working as a clinician and in clinical leadership positions within addiction and mental health services in the community, hospital and custodial settings. She has worked as a sessional academic, teaching undergraduate nursing since 2019. Alana is embarking on an exciting new journey, having recently become employed by an Australian government department as a senior project officer in mental health research. In this role, she'll work on projects and research that will foster and develop mentally healthy workplaces throughout Australia something I'm sure you'll agree we need a lot more of. So it is our great pleasure to hear from Alana. Alana, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kirkpatrick, um, for that introduction. Um, and I really, really would like to um, just say thank you for the invitation. Um, the My experience at Nantien has been it's the most amazing educational journey for me. I have studied several um, degrees, so I can say that Nantien, I walked away um, very whole and intact. <laughs> um, 
so thank you to everyone who has come along to the open day um, and I would like to just share with you all um, just my journey and my experience um, firstly that led me to uh, Nantien and then my experience as a student and then obviously my experience as a graduate the things that I've developed um, my journey to the Nantian Institute. Um, like most things in my life, it was very random. Um, I was taking my children and we were um, on a tour of the temple. Um, and it was on a day that it was market day. So the, the Institute is actually, if, if you ever get the opportunity to come to the temple, the temple's on one side of the freeway and you have to cross the bridge to the other side uh, where the, the Institute is. And I knew nothing about it. Went, had a look at the markets and I'm like, I'm like, oh, wow, this is, oh, this is amazing. I'm going to buy all these candles and things. And then I saw this little open door um, just behind one of the little tense and I thought oh what's in here so I dragged the kids in the pram and I go let's just have a look in here and it was it's inside the institute and they have they had brochures and that and that's the first time that it actually became apparent to me <clears throat> that I always thought I was uh working from a holistic point of view and it was at that point that I realized actually I'm not really I think you know, my work has kind of been pushed towards the medical model and what else is out there. So basically that's where my journey started. Um, and in 2021 is where I, last year was when I finished with, as um, Dr, as Professor Kirkpatrick had said, with a Master of Arts in um, Health and Social Wellbeing. This degree has opened the door to my dream job, um, to be able to work um, on as a senior project officer in the federal government um, and in mental health research. Like I, it just ticks so many boxes for me and it wouldn't have been possible if I didn't have um, the Masters of Health and Social Wellbeing because I'm sure a lot of you, 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 you've, you've worked, you know, the impacts of stress and everything that goes on in the workplace. Um, hopefully with the things that I have learned in a, and utilise them in Australian workplaces, we can, we can make mentally healthy workplaces. Um, as a student, um, having done quite a few degrees and gone through a lot of hoops, I decided there was a few things that I wanted in my next degree. <laughs> um, and so for me, work-life balance was really important. Um, and that's something that Nantien, it ticked my box straight away. Uh, I have, I had done um, intensives in, in other courses and I found them really good because I could focus on one subject and I could do all the content and really, you know, it's five weeks, intensive you just incorporate everything and it is a bit stressful you do have a few assessments but it's done then you move on to the next one I have also had experience where I've taken four subjects at a postgraduate level and you just you know you have to have really good time management and all over the place with the five-week intensives one at a time and I started mid-year so I didn't have to start at the beginning um, it worked out perfectly for me. Um, the fact that it went fully online with the pandemic uh, was also a, a, a tick for me. Um, and having all the resources online and available so that I'm able to learn at my own pace when I'm free. I have four young children, so there's juggling that juggling work um as a woman of pacific background i also have responsibilities to my community here in australia the, the diaspora in australia and um and the values of nantien actually 
they gel and mesh so well with my own cultural values and the way, you know, my personal values. So the values also meant something to me um, and they just embodied and really it almost kind of like nurtured, like ushered me, nurturing me into come into the, the, the Nantien um, family, really. That's, it, it feels, you just feel so connected. Um, once I made that leap and, you know, the, even the sign-up was very simple and I was studying, obviously I had other courses to have experience um, on. The definitely having all our classes, um, the five-day intensives, having them all recorded and being able to just go back and when you're when you're reading your your content or doing your assignment you're like oh I remember there was something that was said you know you could pick the day and you know that it's in the first session it's like oh I just can't remember that little bit of gold that that one of your fellow students just came up with and you you want to remember it so quite you know easy go back have a have a look um plus you know baby brain you know you just can't retain a lot of things for too long so um but using the contemplative pedag pedagogy you know was setting that intention and that time you know it was good for me as well because you know I, I told my husband we have to do this this is part of the course I have to set intention and have uninterrupted time and he was very supportive skeptical but supportive and I'm like oh, yes so um, for all the mothers out there or fathers who may be juggling multiple things, carers, um, setting that intention, having that time, it, you know, embodying what they're teaching you and practising it, it's so beneficial. It's not natural for me. It wasn't natural for me to start with. But once I just let go and embraced it, oh, it, it, was, it was amazing. Um, I also appreciated, because I do a lot of, you know, catch-ups at night, um, being able to email student services or Jamila in the library and having questions and I could wake up in the morning and, you know, there would be an answer or, you know, maybe mid-morning when I finally get around to checking things. So I didn't have to stress for very long um, not knowing something. And I'd say the teaching staff, you know, they they truly embody what they teach. Um, and they're the most approachable, humble and knowledgeable people I know um, on, on these topics. Um, I felt 100% supported through my whole journey. You know, they always say, oh, that silly question. I never felt that any question was a silly question. I felt comfortable. And even the, the, the students, they respected that. And it was such a positive learning environment, even though we were all online. And there was a lot of people who would feel like, oh, my gosh, the pandemic, et cetera. But true connection. <coughs> um, I also felt I had experienced some personal health issues during my, my um, journey and the compassion and the understanding that I received from my teachers. Like, you already feel bad and you feel like a burden, but then when you're met with this, you know, this compassion and understanding, <coughs> um, it's one less thing to worry about. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not a fan of public speaking. <laughs> If you were to ask me to pick my favourite subject. <laughs> I'm like kid in a candy store. They're all my favourite. Everything, everything helped me grow. Everything helped me, both personal and professionally. <laughs> Whether it was learning about art therapy, coaching or counselling. Hey, I even learned about nutrition, compassionate work and mindfulness for professionals. It was amazing to learn 
the literature, to be exposed to the literature, and then to have the opportunity and the time to practice it. <coughs> I valued this so much. So in true Nantian style, I had to take some time to reflect on how, how my studies at NTI helped me grow personally and professionally. My number one would be to learn mindfulness and meditation, um, to actually learn from very experienced people, <coughs> not just YouTube, um, and to be able to ask questions, you know, techniques, having that live person, oh, it was just, it really helped my technique, I can tell you that, and I use it, I use it to this day. I use it with my children and it, it really brings serenity and harmony to our lives, um, especially having a mother who can recognise when she's experiencing distress or whatever and not, not judge that I'm being a bad mother or whatever, but sitting in that emotion and, and you know, being curious as to what what's the trigger what's going on for you it really rubs off onto to my whole family and my whole life um friends uh colleagues etc and you don't really realize it until one day someone would say to you hey you know what you said the other day and I'm like oh what what did I say and then when they would tell you it, and it would be like oh my gosh it's another 90 end thing like it, it's you just it really embodies, the, I, I can't stress enough how much of this you will use in your life um, if you really embrace the content and, and just trust the process. Um, so, yeah, I might have alluded that as a mother and a, and a nurse, my studies helped me recognise that I was actually running on an empty tank. Um, and I really took the opportunity to use the reflective assessments um, to be honest with myself and start there. And it was the first time I was actually able to really be self-compassionate and experience, allow myself to experience compassion. <coughs> and, and all I can say is compassion is energizing. It's not depleting, which uh, as a nurse, you feel empathy, but you'll go home at the end of the day and it'll be like, there's just so much suffering in the world. With compassion, I don't know, it's almost like a battery. You just, it just keeps going and going and, and, and having that mindfulness to know when, okay, I, I need to step back. Um, it makes you a better clinician. It makes you a better person. Um, so learning self-compassion was great. Um, and learning to be kind to myself was another one. Um, being able to truly connect, I was able to beat burnout. Um, I actually thrived uh, during uh, the pandemic. Um, and I, I became a beacon and support for a lot of people in my life who just needed somebody to to acknowledge their suffering, to recognize that life is tough right now. And, you know, it, it's one of, it's a blessing for me to be able to give that to other people. So that that service. And I learned to embrace and be comfortable with the uncomfortable, which I think oh, is, um, you know, especially in my line of work, uh, you need to have that. Um, to be able to have those difficult conversations in a kind but compassionate way. Um, I was all, and another one was, I was able to be, have more confidence in using wellness techniques. Um, so your, your breathing, deep breathing and, you know, meditation, mindfulness, etc. cetera. Um, and that you can be kind and gentle, but still be strong. Um, that compassion, like I said, compassion is energizing for me and there's no depleting and the literature actually supports that. Um, that being able to be non-judgmental and to give space uh, and sit with emotions. I do this with my kids. Like if my kids are kind of like a guinea pig, 
um, you know, sit in that space with them, let them allow them to experience those emotions, and then we work through them. Um, it's 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 it helps them and it helps me. Um, having a deeper understanding of suffering, um, you really learn about suffering, um, and being and being comfortable to support others through their suffering. Um, I was also, I felt confident to be able to express um, my knowledge and my ideas. Uh, and not just because they were in a magazine or on a breakfast TV show, or maybe because they were trending on TikTok, but it was because that the content is evidence-based. It's academically rigorous. There are so many people who devote their lives to these things and all this information Nancy N brings together in a truly interactive, easy to navigate um, activities. It's, it, they really simplify it for you so that you're able to, to do the reflection, to really look at you know, the content and not just have to, oh, I have to tick this box and tick this box. NTI will not, is not a tick box exercise. It truly is. Um, to incorporate um, these things into your life. So this has been my experience of NTI and I do apologise for the coughing. Um, it's public speaking, I get nervous. Um, I often felt that I was doing something wrong uh, at NTI because the learning was so enjoyable. <laughs> um, but the truth was it... it, it I was doing everything right. Clearly my grades reflected that. Um, but it was just the way they deliver the content, the way they give, give you the space to learn and to practice and just the whole atmosphere. Um, that's the key for me. Um, and it's nothing like any other postgraduate course I have ever done. Um, I thrived in the learning environment. The contemplative pedagogy, not only in the learning space, but in my workspace, I use it. Um, it's not just a set of rules that I learned once upon a time in, in nursing school. It's actually, a, it's just become second nature for me and I'm truly grateful for that. The wellness practices are also at the center of, of my experience. Um, my fondest memory will be in the breaks, uh, putting on music and meditating under my desk uh, and then coming back rejuvenated for the next session. Um, I'm truly grateful. And there's some great apps that are recommended as well. Um, I've, I've retained so much of the information and I use so much of it. And um, I've grown as a human being, as a mother, as a wife, as a nurse. So I would like to just finally say, if you have read the course guide and the subject guides and they resonate with you or they give you hope and they inspire, inspire you to make change, please follow that spark. You will not regret it. And if you haven't read them yet, please take some time to have a look. Um, the, the learning journey is the most life-changing and positive thing you could do for yourself. And you'll have that knock-on effect for the rest of the people in your life who are part of your life's journey. Um, thank you. Alana, thank you so much. Um, I think you really did share your, your passion and your engagement um, in a very palpable way. But Cecile and Alana, I'd like to thank both of you so much for sharing your stories so openly and so generously today. But for our audience, um, while both of our alumni have extensive professional experience, successful careers, and I think you'll agree with me, truly impressive educational backgrounds, please don't think that that's what you need to have in order to study successfully with us. Our staff will work with you to help you succeed regardless of your background. But it's now time for us to move into the breakout rooms where you will be able to engage with course specific information. You have the choice of joining a conversation in the health stream where we will talk about health and social well-being and mental health. Or you can choose the Buddhism stream 
where we will discuss applied Buddhist studies and humanistic Buddhism. Please take this opportunity to ask questions and to find out as much as you can about the course that you're interested in. In a moment, you will be prompted to choose one of the two streams. If you're uncertain, I assure you that you will receive a recording of both streams. So we ask that you choose one group and stay with that group for the allocated time period. As I said, the sessions will be recorded and you will be emailed a link to both of the recordings so that you can refresh your memory of the session that you attend or watch the session that you missed. You are now invited to join a breakout room. Thank you. Welcome back. I hope that you found the breakout sessions to be informative and I hope that you took advantage of the chance to talk with staff and to ask questions about what to expect when you study with us. This brings to a close today's open day. Just a reminder, we will follow up with all participants. You should expect to receive an email with links to all of the recordings, we will reach out to you directly so that you can have a conversation with our student enrolment officers about study possibilities or arrange a meeting with an academic. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us with your additional questions. And if you live locally or happen to be in the Wollongong area, please drop in and visit us at our beautiful campus. You might even want to arrange to speak with a staff member while you're on the campus. Once again, thank you from me and from all of our staff. Thank you so much for joining with us and for your interest in studying at Nantian Institute. I look forward to meeting you when you are a student at Nantian. Thank you very much. Take care. Good night. Hi there. I think that I'm just checking. I think that um, we're only NTI now. Okay. Looks like it. Yep. Let's go. Cool.